All right, thanks uh, very much. I hope you all had a good lunch and had a chance to take a look at the exhibits uh, that we have around here. I heard there was a great talk uh, in the boardroom. I hope you all were able to, to participate in that and take advantage of it. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I try and drink a little bit of water here. Last time we had me, but not the speakers. This time you had the speakers, but not me. We're all together again, and uh, for one of my favorite parts of the Global Strategy Forum, uh, this is our debate segment. Uh, and uh, this is one of my favorite parts for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, I think it is important to show that you can have a debate uh, and have a constructive debate with interesting uh, discussions uh, of both agreement and disagreement that hopefully we can all come away with some interesting uh, thoughts off of, and I hope that we can show that uh, here today. It's also one of my favorite uh, segments because uh, hopefully we will have you all participating a little bit. You should all see on your seats or on seats nearby you uh, some polling ballots for you to take a position uh, on the resolution that we have uh, placed before our debaters uh, here. Uh, and we're going to poll you after the uh, debate as well, just to see if uh, anybody's had any changes of heart, mind, or otherwise uh, based on the discussion that we've had uh, here. And as you can see, by the way, we uh, uh, titled this uh, particular debate, we're uh, playfully uh, playing off of uh, a phrase that's been used uh, quite uh, frequently and quite broadly broadly and sometimes somewhat inconsistently uh, in the current uh, presidential discussion about making uh, America great. Uh, what we really want to talk about is not just about making America great, what makes America great, but how uh, to help America stay great. Uh, and so we have two really, uh, at least to me, I'm, I'm thrilled to have these two speakers uh, here for, for a number of reasons, two great speakers in this uh, field who I've seen so many times and really enjoyed hearing from so many times, I hope you will uh, as well, uh, to really talk about two different aspects of uh, making America great and how to help America uh, stay, stay great. First, we have uh, David Rothkopf, who is now an alum of the Global Strategies Forum, uh, having attended our inaugural strategy forum last time. So thank you so much uh, for coming back. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure you all know David Rothkopf from uh, his uh, books and the work that uh, he is uh, continuing to do as CEO and editor editor of Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, he is also a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, and president and CEO of Garten uh, Rothkopf, an international advisory firm specializing in emerging markets uh, investment and risk management and related services. Hopefully I got that all uh, right. Uh, also, we have uh, Corey Shockey, who is currently a uh, research fellow at the Hoover uh, Institution. And during the uh, 2008 uh, presidential election, she was uh, senior policy advisor to the McCain-Palin uh, uh, campaign uh, and previously deputy director for policy planning uh, in the State Department. Uh, and both of them will take different perspectives on this particular uh, resolution that we have uh, going forward. Uh, I'll be moderating, so we're going to find out whether they will talk to each other or they will talk to me uh, on this particular uh, piece. And I will be moderating through a fairly structured uh, debate uh, format, which some of you have seen us use before, starting with some opening comments uh, from David, opening comments from Corey, a short rebuttal period from David, a short rebuttal period from Corey, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience for you all to ask questions, uh, to contribute to the debate uh, as well, and then close with some closing comments from both speakers uh, before we go to the final polling. So that's the approach uh, we're going to use. Again, I remind you all that you have ballots either on your seat, uh, in some cases it looks like under seats, uh, and in nearby seats. Please uh, uh, find yours and uh, participate uh, in our session. Uh, and we will now turn to uh, opening statements from David Rothkopf on making America great and helping America stay great. Um, first of all, this is going to be very challenging because I agree with Corey on most things. Uh, and I also like Corey better than most people that I know. So, uh, uh, um, uh, well, I don't want to say all people that I know. I have family and others that, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we have sort of set aside this discussion about whether America needs to be made great again. And, and the reason is it's a ridiculous discussion to have. First of all, I'm not going to be put in the position of agreeing with Donald Trump on anything. Um, I, you know, I am personally of the view that people who suggest that Donald Trump, uh, because he's had a certain degree of success, is entitled to a certain degree of respect are completely wrong. 
that is false objectivity. A uh, person who is a threat, uh, who is incompetent or who is repulsive, needs to be referred to as a threat, incompetent, and repulsive if those are the facts. He is a threat, he is incompetent, and he is repulsive. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do want to make sure that, that I'm not in his lane on anything. Having said that, it's also ridiculous to discuss whether America is great or not. Okay, it's the richest and most powerful nation in the world. It has been the richest and most powerful nation in the world for a long time. It is going to remain the richest nation in the world for a bit. And on, in terms of power, it is going to remain the world's most powerful nation. There is only one country on Earth that has the ability to project force uh, from space, from the air, from land, and from the sea, anywhere in the world, anytime, and that's us. There is only one country in the world that has the financial wherewithal that we have that is the hub of the financial universe. Uh, and frankly, there's only one country in the world that has the social and cultural impact that we have. And in a world that is literally years away from having everybody on the planet connected in a man-made system for the first time, and therefore literally years away for the first time in history being one cultural ecosystem, being the world's cultural superpower is vitally important to being the world's uh, overall superpower. We're there. But as any CEO of any great company will tell you, to be great, you have to focus on staying great. You have to focus on reinventing yourself. And so the real debate we ought to be having is what do we focus on in order to reinvent ourselves as a country? And the pr first issue is that the economic system in the United States has ceased to work. For the past 40 years, we have had economic growth without corresponding wage growth. Over the course of the past decade and a half, we've had economic and productivity growth without actually having the people at the bottom of the economy benefit in the way that the people at the top of the economy have benefited. Uh, inequality has grown to levels of the Gilded Age. Uh, but and as bad as that is, there's something worse, which is we don't actually know how to create the jobs of the future. Um, productivity is going to accelerate. Who's going to be creating those? Well, if we can't maintain the economic engine, if we can't figure out how to create a job, if we haven't, can't even have the debate about what is really a job and how long people should work, we're not going to get anywhere. And right now, if somebody were to say people should work past the age of 65, there are 50 buildings in this town that would explode, and people would run out into the streets and tell you this is crazy. You know, we have to be able to have that debate. We're not having that debate. We then have to have the asset allocation debate. And when you look at how the budget of the United States government is organized, there's only one moving part because of growing entitlements, and that is defense spending has to go down. Um, and uh, now, we have a defense system that was uh, invented by committees and designed with every wrong incentive system that you could possibly have in it. And as a result, we have four air forces, two expeditionary systems, four forces. We have uh, a navy organized around carrier battle groups, which makes no sense in the modern world. We have 13 intelligence agencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Somehow we've got to actually have a debate about how do you rationalize that, because that's the only pot of money we've got, so that we can spend money on education, on infrastructure, which we haven't spent money on since the Eisenhower era, and the things that we need to do in order to be competitive. Now, I've just got a couple minutes left, and so the question is, you know, is that enough? And of course, it's not enough. Okay, the international system has a bunch of um, institutions in it were invented at the end of the Second World War that um, are, were designed to be weak in the first place and are obsolete in the second place. As a consequence of that, uh, it is in need of revitalization and we need a strategy r around our role in the world that focuses on that, which means we need to revitalize the transatlantic alliance. We need to rethink the Asia-Pacific alliance as we've got. We need to think of the Asia-Pacific region um, as the Indo-Pacific region because there's only one way to deal with the rise of China, and that is including India in the picture. We don't think in those terms. We're not organized to think in those terms. We've got to organize our government to be able to deal with those kinds of things. Um, and I would say beyond that, we need to recognize, as I intimated earlier, that the world is at the verge of a group of profound changes. 
change is associated to having everybody on the planet connected in a man-made system for the first time. Change is associated with a connected world. You've talked about these earlier today in terms of some things like cyber, but cyber isn't really the issue. The issue is that in a world where everybody's connected, identity changes, community changes, the role of government changes, rights and uh, within a society change, you have to ask questions, do you have a right to the internet? If you don't have uh, the ability to access a job without having a right to the internet, um, then perhaps you need to rethink constitutions. There are currently nine constitutions in the world that actually grant people the right to the internet. Uh, we have new uh, security threats related to this, but we need to rethink our doctrine. The reality is that in the Cold War era, the price of conflict was so high that nobody dared fight. Uh, in the Cool War era, the era of cyber conflict, the price of conflict isn't so low that perhaps people will not dare stopping fighting. Uh, and those cons the threat of constant warfare, uh, even if it does not seem like nuclear warfare in terms of the Im imminent threat, is one of higher tension between all parties at all times, and higher tension leads to the prospect of more conflict. All of these things require not new policies first. They require us to figure out what the questions are. We're not even having a debate about what the questions are about who am I, who, what is a government, what are our rights, what is war, what is peace. Your grandchildren will never know what paper money is. They will not know what a central bank is because central banks just simply don't have a role in this kind of new economy. Well, if they don't, how are we going to regulate this economy? And if it moves to being a big data economy where you have the ability to find different kinds of correlations than national correlations, then the question you're going to have is, what kind of data do we need? What kind of metrics do we need? What is an economy? What kind of incentives? We're at a watershed in global history. And that watershed in global history requires new questions and new kinds of creativity in order for America and for every other country to adapt to this world. It requires something of us that none of us have been forced to do, which is to really go back to square one in almost every area and ask questions about um, the nature of the challenges we face, the nature of the options that we have, uh, and we are not having that debate. So I would say, uh, overarchingly, the principal thing that we need for this new era and to remain great is to figure out what the right questions are. Thanks, David. And uh, really great uh, initial comments on getting the questions uh, right. I also just wanted to mention, in case there was any concern, the tearing and ripping sounds you heard weren't people ripping up uh, opinions or papers or arguments. Those are the ballots. If you haven't voted yet, there are folks picking up ballots. Please use the sheet. You can tear off your vote uh, on the sheet and hand it in to one of the staff who are walking around uh, trying to collect those ahead of time. And then we'll go to Corey for her uh, perspective on this uh, question as we go forward. Corey. Uh, so there's a terrific book written by Sakhvan, Sakhvan Berkovich, a Harvard history professor, called The American Jeremiah. And it's my favorite book in forming this question because his argument is that the United States has, since its inception, believed it was failing, right? Like Jeremiah in the Old Testament um, always believes that things are going wrong and never going to get better. And that is, in fact, the secret of American success. Um, that we always think we're, the Puritans believed that they were isolated from God and that's why they were going to suffer um, on the Mayflower, right? We, like we always think we're around. In the 1950s, we thought that the German economy was overtaking us. Already, less than 10 years after World War II, the Germans were making the United States economy uh, a thing of the past. The Japanese in the 1970s, uh, and now the Chinese. And in fact, in that anxious, oh my god, everything we're doing is wrong, we have so many advantages, and we are not making good use of them, that David's talk so nicely illustrated. That is the seed of American success, because we figure out what the questions are, we figure out a range of solutions to the problems, and work on them. And in fact, the reason that American power is so enduring in the international order is that almost alone among countries, all of our problems are within our ability to fix them. No other country has the freedom of action that the United States does. No other country has a political system tied so tightly to the public. And at least for me in this crazy presidential election cycle, I've just finished writing a history 
that starts in 1823 and 19, ends in 1923. And it's oddly comforting in this crazy political cycle to, real, to realize that we are not newly a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. <laughs> that in fact the United States has almost always been a country full of crazy people uh, run by reckless politicians. But we very often underestimate our strengths. The World Economic Forum evaluation of global economies describes the United States as having a unique combination of exceptional innovation capacity, large market size, sophisticated businesses, collaborations between firms and universities, human capital, company spending on R&D, flexible labor markets, and a well-developed financial sector. And I, I read that because it illustrates that it's actually very difficult to get right what the United States has right. And even less so economically than socially. The panel that we had earlier today about the, the trade-offs that Muslim Americans feel between being Muslim and American or American and Muslim, that we have those loud, fractious conversations is actually really healthy for our society. Um, that immigration is, in fact, something that we get more right than any other country. And it changes the, the view, society's view of itself. Our, our fundamental notion that immigration is the lifeblood of our country allows us to be open to changing mainstream society in a way almost every other country genuinely struggles with. And let me just give you a couple of statistics about immigration, because I think it's the right metric for judging what America gets right. 42 million immigrants live in the United States, 13% of our population. Another 13% of our population are children of first generation immigrants. A million 300,000 came in 2014 alone. Of those, the main countries were India, China, Mexico, Canada, and the Philippines. 47% um, of immigrants become naturalized American citizens. 44% of them have bachelor's degrees. 30% of them work in management and professional fields. 64% of them have family connections in the United States, which actually helps integrate and stabilize immigrant communities. 11 million applicants for 50,000 lottery visas the United States gave out last year. Um, over 100,000 people became naturalized American citizens through military service through since 2002. This great coming together that immigration creates is um, extraordinarily hard for countries to get right. And for a whole series of crazy reasons, we mostly get it right. Um, and it's an enormous advantage. In, uh, one other thing I would say is that the way the world is changing, that David spoke so eloquently about, the, the atomization of societies, the empowerment of individuals, um, the mobilization of, of the concerned groups, crowdsourcing, crowd, all that kind of stuff creates what James Fellows has described as large and atmospheric advantages for the United States. The ecosystem of how the world is changing actually plays to our advantages more than it plays to the advantages of other countries if you take perhaps Switzerland out of the pool. Um, so I would say in conclusion that the way to think about what the United States has right is to ask one question, which is what country's problems would you prefer to have rather than our country's problems? Because we have a political system, as is so often said in American politics, created by geniuses to be run by idiots. And that creates a resilience consistent with who we are as a political culture, who we are as a dynamic, innovative society, and as a people who just build a better mousetrap all the time. Thanks very much, uh, Corey. So we've had a couple of arguments placed on the table uh, with some common ground in between them, but some slight differences in terms of uh, what to do with that uh, common ground. Let me give uh, David a couple of minutes to make some responding comments, if you'd like, uh, to Corey, uh, and then Corey uh, as well. And then we will open it up to a larger uh, discussion. David. First of all, um, I'd like to turn to Corey's reference to Sok Van Berkovich with whom I took some courses at Columbia. 
Um, and what I'm about to say will probably have her run out of the Hoover Institution. But uh, uh, his name, Sakvan, is actually a contraction of Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, his parents <laughs> were um, kind of anarchic. And his sister is actually named Nanelle which is Lenin spelled backwards. <laughs> um, so I just thought I would pass that on to you uh, in terms of the kind of references you're using. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that, that's true, by the way. Anyway, um, not that what else I was saying wasn't true. Um, I, I'll take one other point. I'm going to just sort of throw this out there. Um, to, to go to speak to the point of American greatness. And I urge you to try to consider what I'm saying in a non-political light, although you are going to conclude that it is a purely political statement. Uh, it's not. Um, I worked in both the Clinton administration and as managing director of Kissinger Associates. So I've been you know, sort of in, in both places. Um, but you talk about our system being created by geniuses to be run by idiots. Um, and I, I, you know, it's easy to look at America today and American politics today and throw up your hands because Trump is repulsive and because Ted Cruz is repulsive and because the nature of the debate has been to the lowest common denominator and because there has been violence and racism and hate uh, because the system in Washington is so dysfunctional uh, that you can't have a discussion about getting a Supreme Court justice confirmed. You can't actually get things done. Uh, and it's easy to be despairing. But I have a feeling that in 50 or 100 years, when people look back on this period, they're going to see something else. And again, I urge you to sort of try to Take what I'm saying in an objective way. Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president of the United States, because Donald Trump can't possibly be the next president of the United States. The arithmetic doesn't work. If Hillary Clinton is the next president of the United States, for the first time in 240 years, America is actually going to have elected some re representative of the majority population. Women of the United States have not been fully represented in our democratic process in all of those 240 years and can't be until a woman holds that job. Uh, we are going to have somebody speaking by her existence in the job to the evolution and success of the system. You're also going to have the most qualified person becoming president in a quarter of a century, the most qualified person be taking the lead on US foreign policy in that office in perhaps 100 years, the first Secretary of State to do it since the middle of the 19th century. Um, now, we, the only fact we can dispute here is whether my arithmetic is right about what's going to happen. But if that happens, in 50 or 100 years, what are people going to look at and see? They're going to see that in 2008, America, which was riven with racial divisions, elected a black man as president. And that in 2016, America, which has been, as most countries in the world, unfair to the majority of population, elected a woman to be president. And so this broken political system will actually become truly inclusive for the first time in a quarter of a millennium. And that is remarkable. And I think it's worth keeping in mind and actually being somewhat inspired by. David and I don't actually disagree on anything. Moreover, he's making my side's argument. So I'm going to flip and actually make David's argument for him, which is that it's not hard to see what the United States needs to fix. Um, but our tolerance for not fixing it is shocking. Uh, second of all, uh, the United States is a risk tolerant society, right? Uh, a society where, uh, what is Alexander Hamilton's great phrase? A society of financial esprit, by which he means bankruptcy is tolerated in this country to an extent it is not in most countries. 
Chapter 11 bankruptcy is one of the great causes for churn and turmoil and innovation. But a serious problem for the United States is the mismatch between our sclerotic politics, which are not fixing problems we need to fix, right? The American budget deficit is rapidly becoming the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. That is, everybody knows what the answer is, but nobody will actually take the decisions to do it. We have tolerated this for much too long. At some point, markets are going to run out of largesse for us. And when that happens, it's not going to happen gradually. It's going to have an asymptotic slope of the line, which means the United States, if you think the financial crisis we set off globally in 2008 because of uh, the management of our banks and our housing stock was something, wait until you see when the dollar ceases to have market confidence as a holding currency. And the resentment that will grow by other countries because of the effects of our recklessness in how we manage our own politics, our own economy, and everybody else's that does not have the luxury to shield itself, to shield themselves from the consequences of a public that feels perfectly happy creating a worse banking system than we had in 2008. We have actually now incentivized more large banks um, and given them a bigger role in the market and squeezed out small and community banks with the Dodd-Frank legislation. Another thing that's so obvious that we should fix and yet we are not fixing um, is an international order wherein the United States has allowed to migrate to us too much responsibility for other people's outcomes on their own security. That what used to be in 1950, a NATO alliance in which uh, the United States would reinforce Europe should uh, the Soviet Union uh, move west, is now one in which we constitute 75% of NATO defense spending. And when Baltic states begin to get nervous, Baltic states which we admitted into the alliance without creating the ability to defend them, uh, when they get nervous, the United States alone among NATO allies uh, thinks about how to protect and reinforce them. We have allowed to migrate too much to us what is everyone's responsibility, and we are not changing the international institutions which no longer serve us as well as they serve others. So we've come to an interesting place uh, in the debate, which may make it challenging for the voting. But here's the we way I interpret it. And I want to see if the debaters are OK with uh, heading forward. So I don't think it's necessarily a pro-con or a David versus Corey uh, debate. But I do think there's an interesting discussion here to be had about the elements, which I think actually are in common, of what does make America great in terms of economic uh, base and strength and innovation, uh, cultural uh, robustness and diversity, uh, and what I will call, at least loosely, civil society, to distinguish that from the politics that's going on with civil society. So there's kind of that agreement of that base of strength. But there's some disagreement over exactly uh, what areas need to be addressed to use that to its best advantage uh, going forward. So I'll point out a couple that you raised, I think, David, uh, and then we'll perhaps get your specific reaction to them. Uh, addressing inequality uh, in terms of the economic uh, the economic engine, I think you put it, uh, in the United States. Decreasing defense spending is the only real place we can uh, free up resources to find the resources we need to spend uh, in some other uh, areas. I think there was agreement on rethinking and changing some of the international institutions and using that term broadly, not just organizations, but the, the relationships and the dynamics out there. On the inequality piece and the defense spending piece, Corey, what are your thoughts uh, to what David's put on the table? I agree with David about stagnation of wages. I am less concerned than David. I'm less concerned than, than David is about inequality, because I think Americans actually have a really high tolerance for economic inequality, provided that people believe there's opportunity for everyone to come up. So I'm less concerned about inequality than I am about 
the way that, for example, if I know your zip code, I can predict the likelihood of your children getting into a good college because I can tell you the quality of the elementary school education that they are getting. Um, so, so the access to opportunity, we are not nearly worried enough about. Uh, I'm not particularly worried about defense spending uh, because I think that, you know, with 45% of the global total, uh, we ought to be able to protect our country's interests uh, with that. And I don't believe, I think as long as we have two, is August Cole here? Because I'm going to plug his terrific book, Ghost Fleet. Um, as long as we continue to have space in our budget for two manned fixed wing fighters as programs of record, when the technology and operations are so obviously driving us very fast towards unmanned platforms, defense spending's not that tight if we can still have F-22s and F-35s in our budget. About what Corey said about America's high uh, risk tolerance for inequality, and then let me add one other piece that you didn't address in this, but I'd be interested in your take: uh, the role of international trade in uh, how you think that either contributes to or is a challenge for uh, the U.S. economic engine. TTIP, TTP uh, have been discussed mostly in kind of a black and white, good or bad uh, sort of way. What's your view uh, of international trade in those types of trade agreements uh, in that discussion? Well, first of all, with regard to inequality whether we tolerate it or not, it's immoral. Uh, secondly, the bottom fifth has less of a chance of moving up to being the second or the, the, the middle fifth than they've had in the recent past. Uh, thirdly, the means by which we get them up there have gone down. Uh, the uh, inner city schools right now, if you're a minority student in an inner city school, you have less, uh, less than half of minority students actually graduate high school. If you don't graduate high school, you're done. You're not actually competitive in this system at all. I heard a, a statistic yesterday where if you're in Chicago and you uh, enter the ninth grade, you, there's a, an even lower likelihood that you will graduate from high school. Uh, meanwhile, our education system uh, has gone from a system where in the 1940s, 15% uh, of people received A's. Uh, in college to a system where in, in the current area, era, uh, half receive A's in college. So we're kind of giving people awards for showing up. Um, we are not challenging people. We've cut back on art spending in the United States at precisely the wrong time because uh, as we go into a, a more technically empowered era, while we do need science and, and engineering and math, uh, uh, a lot of the science and engineering and math work that's been done in the past is actually being done by machines. And what we really need is creativity. Uh, and we need uh, people to be trained in creativity. And as it happens, uh, training people in the arts not only helps that, but it helps with a lot of other things like staying in school, staying together, giving us the kind of cultural power we need in the world. We're not very good at that. Uh, we also have a corrupt political system in the United States, and we don't talk about it as corrupt very often, but the reality is that none of the primaries we're talking about now matter. The only primary that matters is the money primary, because only a few people can actually raise enough money to go and compete in this system. And so inequality is related to that, because if you're in the bottom part and you're not able to give money, you're out of the system. You don't actually get to pick the candidates. And, and unless we fix uh, our, 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 our corrupt campaign finance system in the United States, um, uh, we are not going to improve the problems of, uh, of inequality. And if you think that it's just a coincidence that the top 1% have given the most and dictate the outcomes in the political system, and that they've received 90 plus per percent of the benefits of the last recovery, um, I have some real estate in Bethesda I'd like to sell. <laughs> so I actually want to push back on David's point about our political system. Um, because tawdry as it is, and the influence of money, uh, I'm, I am sympathetic to those lines of arguments. But it does seem to me that our current presidential cycle actually is the counter argument to that. Namely, if money could be determinative, Jeb Bush would be the Republican nominee. And if money could be determinative, Bernie Sanders wouldn't be in contention with the enormous flotilla of money that Hillary Clinton 
is bringing to bear on this. And then, in fact, the, the main reason the American political system is both so vibrant and so reckless is that the system is tied very closely to public attitudes. And what we are seeing this election cycle is a surge of angry populism on both the right and the left. And I think it's precisely a response to the stagnation of incomes and the belief that the we don't have a solution to the way that low-skilled jobs that you used to be able to support a family on, truck drivers, auto workers, those jobs are gone and they're not coming back. And people are demanding that political leadership come up with a solution. So I think we're actually going to be at the start of everybody turning the key in the lock trying to find the solution to that because People who are voting are angry about that. It's driving populism. You can see it in both of the major political parties. And politicians are nothing if not self-interested. So they are going to, sooner or later, somebody's going to find a way to do that. And it's going to cement a political advantage for 10 or 20 years for whoever can do it. American political system of the sort that Corey is defending here do you get a billionaire casino owner as the champion of Trailer Park America? OK. It's a great country, people. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about pick up on the last point that Corey's making to come back at you on the trade issue. What do you think oh. your, your views? Well, first of all, thanks to people like Paula, who I see sitting here in the front row, and a lot of others, we did so much good work on trade in the preceding 50 years that trade's much less important now than it was in terms of trade negotiations. Um, because we've freed up a lot of trade, and I think it's worth noting that. Uh, should we move forward with TPP? Sure, why not? It's not going to actually hurt anybody. The jobs that people think are being outsourced are actually being outsourced to the past. I'd be much more uh, focused on how do you create jobs in the new economy rather than, than, than that. And I think TTIP could form the foundation of a rethinking of the Atlantic Alliance that I hope is a top foreign policy priority of the next president um, by saying, look, we need to rethink our economic ties, our political ties, our military ties, and TTIP is a way to do this. And clearly, you can't object to opening up trade between two parts of the world that are so sort of economically on equal footing. Uh, for the same reasons that you might uh, object to trade with the emerging world. So I think that's important. If I were going to be a trade official in the next administration, I wouldn't, I mean, I would ad advocate those things, um, but I would focus on Mexico and Canada because we actually trade more with them and we can make little improvements in our trade to our northern and southern borders and get huge benefits from it. Um, and it's very unglamorous and it doesn't win you lots of headlines. Um, but you know, we've gone the past nine months, fortunately this has been reversed in the past three days, without actually having an ambassador to Mexico, um, which is ludicrous. You know, ludicrous. I want to put a footnote, it came out of our lunch conversation, but I just want to throw a footnote. The Congress is now talking about wanting to confirm the National Security Advisor as a position in, in the White House at a time when they've demonstrated that they can't rise to the challenge of their confirmation responsibilities in any other area. It's like, it's, 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 it's like a drunk driver offering to set up a car service. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely ludicrous. Um, so, you know, I, th I, th I think there's some things that we can do in trade, um, and, and, and we certainly ought to promote it. Uh, but the big challenge, I mean, we underplay. I was a trade official in the Clinton administration. I was out there promoting it. I think trade's a good thing. We underplayed the dislocation. We underplayed the consequences for people at large. We did it to help serve a political purpose. That was wrong. We have to figure out how you create jobs in the United States of America. I think we need new paradigms. I, by the way, think that means we need new economists advising presidential candidates. You need Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson, who wrote The Second Machine Age, or you know, the, you know, uh, uh, a Race Against the Machine, who are actually thinking about this instead of a bunch of macroeconomists who think that there's three puppet masters in Washington, a little monetary policy here, a little fiscal policy here, and everything's going to be fine. OK, we actually have to get much, much more micro in our search for solutions. 
So Corey, to you on a point that you raised, so notwithstanding the kind of sclerotic political politics that you see going on today, you talked about one of the great strengths of America being our ability to get the question, redefine the question, re-understand the question, and then adjust and adapt ourselves to that uh, new understanding. Uh, some would argue, though, that uh, that is either getting to be also a sclerotic process, and, or at least a very, very slow process, to which we may be falling somewhat behind. In other words, it's not that we aren't getting things and adapting, but we're doing it so slowly that we're being outpaced by uh, events uh, effectively. Others might argue, uh, and I'm going to uh, pull a thread, I'm not going to say that David said this, but pull a thread that because we have so many folks who are used to thinking about things in a particular way, that there's actually a growing divergence uh, between the changes going on in the world and the way we're defining the questions and the answers uh, uh, at least in our political system. What are your thoughts on that? Has there been any change, or do you think that it continues to be a robust part uh, of the American identity? Uh, I do think it continues to be a robust part. I mean, if when Thomas Jefferson was elected president, um, John Adams thought it was going to be the end of the republic, right? Because he was such a reckless, uh, and his economics were unsound. Um, and when John Adams was president, Thomas Jefferson thought the Alien and Sedition Acts were going to be the end of the union, right? So we have a system that actually has a whole bunch of experimentation, most of which is bad. But as the result of that, you end up building a, a sense of what's the scale of the problem? What's the range of choice? What are our ability to do it? If you look at what the United States looks like to other countries, I'm sure many of you have had this experience, right? That people say, oh my god, any idiot can be elected president in the United States. Right? There's no vetting process except voting, um, right? Like the party doesn't have to groom. You don't have to have been the junior whip on labor to get to be a shadow minister, to get to, right? Like, any crazy casino owner can make his case to the American public and possibly even get elected. So I don't actually think the system fails to uh, bring in a whole bunch of ideas. Again, most of them are bad, right? But the system also vets very well because it's tied so tightly to American public attitudes. The system actually has to be responsive to what people are scared about. And if you contrast that, actually, with the problem many parliamentary democracies are experiencing in Europe right now, or the <coughs> meta problem that the European Union is focused on, you have elites who are so far out of sync with what their public is worried about and have so little incentive to be responsive to it uh, that you have an enormous structural problem. Um, and, and ours veers on and off the road, but it is responsive to what people are worried about. There is no overstating the genius of the founders of the United States. It is possible to overstate the qualities of the musical about one of those founders, <laughs> which is Shows you know, that David's 1% that he's already seen Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's, it's not, it's crap, okay? I just, I just want to say, I just, everybody loves, you know, because they know who Hamilton is and they have a $10 bill in there, but whatever. Bad music, bad acting, no story arc. Um, uh, doesn't deserve the Pulitzer Prize of MacArthur. Okay, this, I'm glad we, pardon me? And you don't like rap. I'd like rap. It's crappy rap, rap, rap. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, give them credit for trying, okay? But you know, it sucks anyway. Um, but you know, we do have a system that was appropriately designed because we very rarely get great leaders. You can only name a few of them. Every election morning, we wake up and we think, "Is this the next Washington or Lincoln?" And typically, we end up with the next Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, you know, you, you, you end up with a mediocrity. But it is a system that is successful precisely because it can succeed even when you have a mediocrity. 
And you will go back and you will look at the past 100 years of American history. No president had a better record with regard to US policy towards Africa than George W. Bush. No, no, no president did more to improve US relations with emerging markets, big markets like India, than he did. He, you may have thought Bush was a good president or a bad president, but there's a general consensus that this was a boob who shouldn't have been elected president of the United States. A lot of good things happened on George W. Bush's watch, just like good things happen on the watch of most presidents. Um, and that's a successful system. And so I, you know, once again, I agree with, I, I, I agree with Corey. And by the way, I strongly endorse Corey for a position in any administration. <laughs> Sure Rob Hamilton is now trending on Twitter. Uh, so in that backdrop, I'd like to open it up to you all, and you can feel free to it. Uh, uh, by the way, I spent the first 10 years of my career as a theater director. There you go. So I just want you to know, yes, so that my, my training was in theater, not in foreign policy. So listen to me about Hamilton and not about anything else. <laughs> All right, so we're going to open it up to some questions. We have some microphones coming around. Please identify yourself uh, when you uh, ask a question. And let's start over here, please. Thanks, Alex. Hi, Sandy Swarzbach from the Naval Air War Center at China Lake. Um, my question is to both of you, but primarily to you, sir. When you were talking about that we need to redefine the questions and that we need to focus in on them and look for some answers, who is the we that you would want to point to to start to look at those questions and start to define them, and also to start to search for those answers. And also to you, ma'am, who, who is the them that's going <laughs> to put the questions together and also present the solutions? And then how do you get that message across? We heard earlier about how you put messaging across and how you get the information out there and how you form the narrative. But I don't think we're doing a very good job of forming a cohesive narrative that reaches both the top half and the bottom half of the American people. Well, as far as the we goes, I was thinking of you. Um, it, it, yeah. uh, in other words, we, we actually live in a society where everybody is connected to the center, where everybody can present a view that is seen by everybody else. Doubt me, count the number of views of the top five Justin Bieber videos on YouTube, um, which are seen by hundreds of millions of people. I was watching a cat video last night that was seen by 56 million people. And if you want attention to your ideas, put a cat video in it. Um, but the, 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 you know, uh, that's why you do that. That's what, yeah. um, but, but, but uh, you know, seriously, the reality is it's not going to come from the center, the sclerotic center, to pick up on the term that Corey used earlier. It's not going to come from think tanks, because most think tanks don't think that much. Forgive me for saying this here. The think tanks in Washington are, as I like to put it, um, kind of giant meat lockers in which we store people for our future use in governments um, uh, with you know, sort of minimum amounts of spoilage. Uh, but all the, all the, uh, you know, all, all the incentives in our system, particularly with the confirmation process we have, is f towards incrementalism, because were you to say something radical, you're unlikely to get confirmed. So essentially, what you've got is a bunch of people saying, you know, let's move three degrees left, or let's talk about a process issue that nobody gives a shit about, and try to stay out of, of trouble because I might want to be confirmed. So that means it has to come from outside Washington. Fortunately, go to city, you know, go to Akron, Ohio. A friend of Antoine von Achmel has just written a great book about this stuff, a guy I work with. Go read the book. In Akron, Ohio, they had a problem. They looked at their city. They saw that their tire industry had gone away. And they said, well, what, what skills do we have? They said, well, we have a lot of chemists. And we said, well, maybe we can focus on new materials. And there was creativity. There are a lot of laboratories of creativity out there in the world. And so I would say, cast the glance wide, cast your net wide for this. But anybody can pose those questions. The thing is, you have to demand an answer from the people who are in power. And that we tend not to do. We tend not to challenge the people who are in power with these things. And I think it's very important to do that. Corey? And if you have good ideas, send them to foreign policy. <laughs> so I love this question about the narrative. 
Right. It, one of my hobby horses is the way that we always think that we're not going to be successful in whatever we're doing as a government unless we have a common narrative. And it, it's beautiful and quaint because we're never going to have a common narrative, right? That's not who we are as a people. It's not the kind of government we created. We created a government where everything would leak so that you fight it out in the newspapers and in front of Congress so that you have accountability. And, and uh, the diversity of views eventually, very often, more often than not, leads you to better solutions than if you had a group of mandarins in closed doors making smart decisions about uh, whatever. That said, you know, how is it that the country that has Hollywood movie making, Madison Avenue advertising, uh, that pioneered the 24-hour uh, news cycle, and that has a permanent political campaign, is somehow seen to fail at narratives? That's actually, we're actually so much better at it than we give ourselves credit for. It's one of those examples about the Jeremiah. Oh no, we're losing the war of ideas to an apocalyptic cult. How is that possible compared to one generation safely in the middle class and your children are going to run the country? We're not losing the narrative to ISIS, but we're panicked about the fact that we think we could, and that's why we're coming up with a ton of good solutions. Uh, wait, to ISIS? <laughs> a ton of good solutions. <laughs> on the war of ideas, which you yourself perfectly exemplify, those of you who have not read David's terrific column this week about the role of the arts and culture in societies. Um, it's great. And disagreement in the same breath. Right up here in the front, please. Yes. Thank you. John Simon with Total Impact Capital. It seems, at least for parts of this, you were in violent agreement that America's pretty great. The question I have is national greatness seems a little bit like uh, political capital. You lose it if you don't use it. And so one of the fundamental questions is how do we use our greatness? What is the, the, great, the challenge we should apply this, this, uh, this greatness we seem to have? David, I feel like that's your wheelhouse, my friend. <laughs> I think that what she means is sounds like this calls for a really bullshitty answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> The, 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 you know, look, we use the, 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 the canned answer as I think the right answer. You know, we, we use our, our greatness to advance our national interests. Um, we have to determine what those national interests are. Uh, I think, by the way, it's in the national interest for the world to be more peaceful. I think it's in the national interest for the world to be more just. I think it's in the national interest to have an international system that can resolve disputes in ways other than war warfare. I think it's in international interest to have an international system that uh, actually works where justice is concerned, uh, whether it is affecting the leaders of other countries or the abuses of other countries uh, to a common standard because I don't believe in relativism with regards to those things. Um, uh, but honestly, we're not going to get to those things right now because we have a broken political system that needs to be fixed, and we have a broken education system that needs to be fixed. We have a broken infrastructure system that needs to be fixed. We have a whole set of new questions. We need to reinvent ourselves. We don't know what a job is. Uh, when we, you know, we haven't begun the reinvention of government the way that we've reinvented other industries. Uh, if you're involved in the capital markets, you know, you sort of look at other industries and you've seen where technology is involved, they end up disintermediating lots of people, real estate agents and stock brokers and travel agents and all sorts of other actors. In government, we haven't done it. We could disintermediate lots of government officials and we could eliminate those jobs. Algorithms could reassign tax revenue to other people and distribute it directly to them uh, via machines in ways that are much better than room full of 
people can do that kind of thing. I think we have to reinvent our tax system. By the way, I think we will have to tax people a little bit more, but I think we're going to find ways to do it that are different, like the people of Oregon who figured out that since every car has a GPS system in it, you can actually figure out who's traveling on the highways and tr charge the people who are traveling on the highways for the highways, as opposed to charging other people and do it in tiny increments that just come out of their bank accounts as they go. We're going to reinvent all of that stuff. So I would, you know, my answer to that question is the same as most CEOs' answers to their question would be. If I have excess capital, I'm going to reinvest it in my business in order to make the systems work better, in order for me to grow stronger, which will enable me to project my interests internationally better. See, it was a great answer. <laughs> uh, right up here, please. <coughs> Okay, uh, my name is Michael David. I'm with the faculty at the National Intelligence University. And I'd like to kind of go back to this morning. I think Dr. Zarlin uh, suggested radical change in government and also the long view. And other issues in the panel that followed seem to focus on the need to re-educate ourselves on how we look at ourselves. And so, Thinking of the educational system that I grew up in, which may be closer to yours. Um, I'm not sure how to take that, but go ahead. I, I, had, uh, <laughs> I had a great personal interest in history in foreign affairs, but I also knew that I probably need to have a job. So I tried to mix the two. And luckily, at my university, I could take liberal arts and engineering together. It cost me five years. But I got a BA in Foreign Affairs and a BS in Industrial Engineering. So if you take a long view, radical change of why don't we look at the education system? And if the jobs are, require the education in math, why shouldn't we have a system that integrates both of those capabilities? Why should you just have liberal arts and engineering as separate entities, why don't we reconstitute the education process to produce people that fit in the marketplace? Well, look, I mean, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I, I, no. no, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, two things. Um, our, so to start with, universities are medieval institutions that are so dramatically overdue for radical disruption along the lines that you mentioned. Um, but I can tell you, as somebody who teaches at a pretty good university, the revolution is coming, right? Um, you can see online learning and, and other innovations begin to bring market forces into university education. Um, and you also see the very smart and self-interested, even the cosseted children who are students at Stanford University, um, have market forces in mind when they make their choices. Computer science is the top major for girls at Stanford University. Um, so, uh, so you see them integrating much more technology into a general liberal arts education. That, that change is already coming. What I would um, emphasize, though, is that I think that's actually the wrong level to focus on innovation that we need primary school education that you know if if a kid doesn't read well by the time she's in third grade and that hinges crucially on whether her parents read to her whether they are involved in her education whether they have the bandwidth for that kind of focus if a girl doesn't read well by the time she's in third grade she just falls further and further behind so focus your attention on primary school education, access to good fundamentals for kids. I genuinely believe that access to educational opportunity is the civil rights issue of our time. I, I would just add to that. Because um, I, I, I agree with those things individually. But I, but I have a slightly different view. Primary, secondary school, university, antiquated concepts. Corey's right. This is a medieval system. It's designed for people who go and enter the workforce at a certain age and, and, and might work 15 years or 20 years. They would work in the same job. Okay, now people enter the workforce and they're going to work 50 years. They may work 60 years. They may never 
retire. They're going to have multiple kinds of jobs. You need lifelong education. You don't have uh, purely institutions that you go to to study. You need distributed education. We have the ability to take the best minds and present them to everybody. You can take any course that MIT right now teaches awesome. free on the web, but, but, but guess what? Nobody does. Why? Because the reason that they study is not to learn something, it's to get a certificate. Uh, so we need, we need to change the incentives uh, within the system as well. Uh, but we need to look around the system. Um, uh, in different ways, uh, and I will offer two, okay? One is this issue of standards I touched upon before, okay? We do no one any favor by suggesting there are multiple standards for success in our society. There is one standard, there is one type of excellence. You either work hard and you achieve that standard or you do not succeed. And we have a huge cross-section of schools and students in America being fed the line that they don't have to achieve that standard for one reason or another. They just have to get to a certain point or meet a certain kind of testing requirement. And then they don't understand. And then they go to college, by the way, where most of the colleges are not actually providing them with a quality education. And then they don't understand why they don't have a job. We are selling them short. And then finally, and I'll go back to another point that I've made, because I think Corey makes an excellent point. The majority of the uh, 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 you know, women there to, you know, take, taking uh, computer science courses, that's fine, provided you don't have a sexist tech industry. Um, and right now, you have a sexist tech industry that doesn't hire women, that doesn't promote women. Uh, and so part of the problem is the ability of the workplace to send the right signals to the school place. And if you don't deal with the fundamental inequities that we've got in our society, and I think sexism is the number one, the longest running, the greatest crime of civilization against any part of its society, then we're not going to get there. And so we, you know, we, we, we have to recognize that it's the entire ecosystem of learning and working that needs to be rethought. All the way in the back, please. Okay. Thank you. I'm George Jadishvili, Carnegie Visiting Scholar at Georgetown University. So actually, you, uh, in the answering the previous question, you preempted my first question was about actually American dream, this hard work, Rex to riches like formula. But still, I just want to, if you elaborate more, actually, the questions to both uh, speakers. Uh, does it have to be somehow rebooted, reinvented? So can we say that United States, when it reached serious, very high economic uh, well-being standards, it uh, this era of complacency, or like resting on the laurels, started in the United States. And it is connected somehow to the end of the Cold War when there is no big adversary. And this uh, tied to my second question. Does the United States work at its best when it is really challenged? When it has Sputnik, when it has Cuban uh, missile crisis, it actually it unites the society, ties it together, and it makes sure that it should be on its foot. And uh, when there is lack of serious uh, rival. So it gives rise to this complacency. Thank you. Corey got it right with her opening statement. Um, uh, the, the, the reality is we respond well to challenge. And we've got a system that's designed to do it. Uh, the United States has got something going for it that no other country in the world does. We are great at failure. We don't, there is not a stigma. We allow people to go bankrupt. We allow people to fail. You have to fail. You have to take chances in order to succeed. You look at the, all the people saying, oh my god, the United States, we're on the ropes. Everything's terrible. We had a financial crisis. Which developed economy responded most quickly? Which developed economy responded best? We have a broken political system. How did we respond quickly and well? We had good responses from the Bush administration and a good handoff to the Obama administration and joint policies between those two administrations to enable that to work. When the chips are down, the United States finds a way to do it. Who's inventing, who's leading in terms of new technologies, who's leading in terms of a lot of the reinvention right now that goes in the world? Go to, to just to paraphrase your question, go to any country in the world where you think there is a greater uh, investment or belief 
in the creativity within the system. Okay, I, I, I suggest if you go searching for that, you'll come back to the United States. There's a wonderful article written in The Atlantic by James Fallows in 2010 uh, about America, can America rise again, something to that effect. And he quotes an Australian banker during the financial crisis as saying that, that what is fantastic about the United States is that even though you caused this problem, we are all waiting in awe to see how you will solve it. Um, right? The, the tolerance for turmoil uh, that the United States has is actually quite unusual um, and is something that as globalization advances and economies get more intertwined and also more volatile um, to disruption, that societies that have the resilience and tolerance to handle big disruptions and to figure out what a new way of dealing with them are going to be hugely advantaged. Um, and, and the United States is actually really good at that. And, and look at the rising stars who didn't respond to challenges and didn't grow. Look at Brazil, Russia, India, China, and corruption. Look at how people have known those problems and didn't address the problems, and look at how those problems are now taking a toll. So we're going to do two more quick questions. I'll take them in succession, and then uh, we're going to move on. So up here in the front. And then uh, in the back uh, as well, the, the gentleman with the striped tie. Yes. Okay. Uh, Paula Stern, and thank you very much, David, for your kind remarks, too, and your uh, very stimulating discussion. Um, we had this morning a lot of talk about technological change and just the rapidity of it. Um, our great ground, founding fathers, there weren't mothers in those days, um, uh, recognized uh, that it, we needed a balance, checks and balances, no two strength, and therefore we built in a lot of, if you will, political inefficiency. And yet, uh, you mentioned this great threat, uh, which comes from, I think, you, I think it was a budget deficit, and then the fact that our currency won't be accepted by the rest of the world. Um, I'm wondering if you feel, given the technological um, uh, rapidity, um, uh, whether, uh, and given your concerns about somehow our budget deficit is making us um, vulnerable, um, that uh, the system doesn't need to be tweaked in some way to deal with these 21st century realities. So hold on just or, a uh, perceived uh, concerns. Thanks, Paul. Hold on just a second. Would we'll have the last question from the back there, please? He's right behind you. Hi, uh, Mr. Rothka. Uh, you had mentioned early on about um, how making incremental um, changes in our trade policy with Mexico and Canada could, lead, could reap great benefits for Americans, um, but that we don't pursue those policies because they aren't as appealing to the American voter. And you see this trend with things like infrastructure and education. And I was wondering to the both of you, um, what would be your um, suggestions on how to make these issues more appealing to the average American voter? Thanks for the question. Would you tell us briefly who you are? Oh, uh, Noah Caldwell with ACT, the App Association. Very good. Thanks. Corey, do you want to start with Paula's question? Yeah. Um, so uh, technology is actually one of the interesting metrics of the resilience and vitality of the American system, right? Nine of the top 10 tech firms uh, by earnings are American, Tencent, the Chinese firm being the only outlier in that, uh, on that horizon. Moreover, it's, you know, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a smart, go in some place, uh, somebody just out of Wharton would go into finance, right? Now, the great sucking sound you hear is all those people coming to Silicon Valley, right? To get rich, because it's where the action is. And the ethos of the valley is fail fast, fail often, right? As David said, there's no. Uh, and I was having a conversation with a Washington-based journalist a couple of weeks ago out at Stanford. And I was extolling the virtue of this, that it's such a vital environment, so exciting, so much is changing. Uh, 
And, and I got a very condescending uh, response from him in which he sort of said, well, but that's because what you do out here isn't that important. In government, we can't afford to fail. And it was ridiculous, right? So I levitated up and was like, you are failing at everything. You haven't balanced a budget in forever, right? We're, you're so cost inefficient. You're not, the populism we see in our political cycle now is a direct result of you people not solving problems. Um, and so not very polite of me. But the point is that government, too, is ripe for a whole bunch of disruption. And what we are seeing is a lot of uh, philanthropy it coming from people who have been in the tech industry, right? Bill Gates is the, the big, obvious, big one, right? Helping even more important than what George Bush did in Africa is what Bill Gates is doing in Africa, which is helping build robust healthcare systems that are distributed and not, anyway, all that good stuff. We will see that perking into the system as these people get you know, tired of making even more money um, or they begin to, as Mark Zuckerberg has, taken an enormous interest in the educational system. Um, the, we see change agents in the system. And as David argued, our system is so incredibly porous and responsive. Uh, that I actually think a fair amount of change will come and will come pretty quickly. First of all, I thought that was a great answer. Entirely correct. Um, uh, I, uh, I, 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 in, in fact, I would go further. I think we need radical restructuring in Washington, not incremental restructuring in Washington. I think this takes every aspect of government and calls it into question. I think the structure of our cabinet departments makes no sense. You don't need a commerce department. You don't need, and, and, and maybe we, we ought to stop being the only country in the world that doesn't have a ministry of culture. Think, think about it. only one country in the world doesn't actually promote the arts as a national priority. Uh, we have government that is far too big. We spend far too much on defense spending. We don't spend enough on infrastructure. We have a budget that doesn't treat an investment dollar the same way as a regularly spent dollar, even though every other company in the United States has a different system. We have uh, rights that don't reflect the new reality of the world. It's good to have a free press, but do you have a right to the internet? It's good to, you know, I mean, we need to ask fundamental questions about that. We need to rethink what taxation is, how it's done, how money is distributed. We've discovered an amazing thing with aid dollars. If, if you give it, to, you know, and this, by the way, I'm glad you're all sitting down. We've discovered that the best thing you can do for somebody who is poor and in need is give them money. OK, not give them an aid organization. Send them a check. Better yet, transfer money to the bank account that they access from their cell phone. OK, there is no place you can look in the United States government where things are structured the way they ought to be, structured the way they'd be if you set it up right now, structured the way they should be if, if you were um, given a blank piece of paper and you started designing uh, what was optimal. And we need to change it. How do you change that? It gets to your question. And this is the ultimate cop out, and you'll forgive me. I don't think we need to learn about narratives. We're really good at narratives, OK? And you can look everywhere for examples of that. Kim Kardashian had a sex video, created more interest, so they did a show about her family. When the interest on that was beginning to wane, they did one about, well, you figure it out. I mean, the thing has just gone on and gone on. America figures out what the narrative is. What we lack is leadership. We lack people who are willing to risk failure at the highest levels in the United States government. We have had a president for the past seven years who is a talented, smart, earnest man who has shied away from every direct major conflict that he has needed to, 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 to tackle, um, with very few exceptions. I can name one or two exceptions, and I give him credit, particularly on the domestic side. We need stronger leadership than we've got if you're going to do radical restructuring of the government, if you're going to 
lead in the world to take advantage of our abilities uh, around the world. Um, and we need to value and reward that. And, uh, and, and, and as I said earlier, our system is actually designed to, to promote the go along, get along, beige community of Washington, as opposed to the people who are actually willing to take risks, come up with new ideas. American people felt we should intervene in Europe. America firsters, okay? There is a candidate now who says America first. If you want to see how that worked out, go back to the 1930s. Closing thoughts and then back. I think what I'd ask you to do, though, because I think we've had actually a really great discussion here, is maybe just uh, highlight what your maybe one or two big takeaways from your perspective from this discussion are, the main things you'd like uh, the audience to be thinking about based on this discussion. And then for all of you in the audience, uh, I've been plugging these uh, paper ballots for a little while. It's not going to quite work exactly the same way uh, that we had thought. But I think this is, a, this is actually a great example. So uh, the whole formal structure of the debate here has turned much more into, I think, a really interesting constructive discussion. Uh, I think what we've really shown here is you don't have to disagree and just say yes and no and no and yes uh, in order to really explore some subject matter. I think we've done a really remarkable job of exploring this space and this question, especially in this very, very political time, in this very, very political context, uh, without having to do that. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and hopefully in in a good way, and hopefully it will not focus on your comments on Hamilton, is uh, vote either in the affirmative if the key points, takeaway points that uh, David highlights in his closing statements are uh, resonate with you more strongly, or vote in the negative as they're listed on your uh, sheet if you believe that the key points that Corey highlights uh, resonate with you uh, more strongly. And Corey? Uh, I, we'll have someone over to study that right, uh, right away. It'll take a little while. Uh, though, Corey, over to you. <laughs> so um, it seemed domestic policy as well as um, foreign policy. What we need to do, though, because we are a government so responsive to its public, as Thomas Jefferson said, the only safe responsive, uh, the only safe repository for power is the people themselves. And the biggest mistake we are making, I would disagree with David slightly, I think we do certainly have a lack of leadership, but that is our own fault. To answer the question of the woman who asked, who's the we in this, right? Like the first words of the Declaration of Independence are we the people. Our politicians, like politicians everywhere, tend to be venal and self-interested. And we have been rewarding that for much longer than we ought to have. We have serious problems to solve of bringing our preferences for our social welfare state into line with our preferences for our spending. We have been out of whack for a generation on that and unwilling to bring them into alignment. So even though that sounded like an awesome closing statement, I am going to do the following. In part. Um, I offer you, uh, because this is Washington, an acronym. OK, three letters, Q-A-A. -A. OK, the first letter is Q for questions. Go to a lot of conferences, we get a lot of answers, but we aren't asking the right questions. Think about what the right questions are. Go back to basics real basics, because the world is changing in a profound way, and say, what are the right questions about what I'm doing, what I'm interested in? Um, this is where we fail so often in Washington. We tend to analyze things in terms of, how do I avoid the problem we had yesterday? Uh, uh, we fall into heuristic traps. You want to avoid it. Ask the right questions. Then you will come to the right answers. Uh, it's been attributed to, to Einstein, although some people dispute whether he said it, that if he had an hour to solve a problem, he'd spend the first 55 minutes thinking of the right question because then he knew in the last five minutes he'd get the right answer. If he didn't say it, he should have said it. Um, uh, it's, you know, get to the right answer. But then do the thing that's even harder to do in Washington and harder to do elsewhere, and that's action, and that's the last day. Stop talking about changing the world. Stop talking about changing everything. 
Stop talking about grand strategies. Identify one thing you can fix and fix it. One life you can make better, one office you can make run more pro better, one problem you can solve, OK? Because we all tend to think that if we're involved in a lofty discussion, that's the same as a solution. And we are at a time when we need solutions. Think small, think practical, pick one thing. The other thing that I would advise you to do, if you don't know what you're the right thing to think about, read stuff that Corey Shockey writes, writes about. <laughs> or better yet, listen to her every week on Foreign Policy's ER podcast, uh, where she and I and a couple of other people talk about this stuff all the time. She's terrific. So let's all thank uh, the participants here. And I can easily say you should be reading what both of them are writing and listening to what both of them are saying. And you can tell from this particular discussion. So my failure as a debate organizer, I think, resulted in a success as a discussion convener. Uh, I really uh, both appreciated and enjoyed uh, the opportunity to even sit between you to have uh, this particular discussion, because I really think this discussion and many of the points you raised absolutely epitomized why we're gathered here today, what this conference is trying to do both in terms of hearing from people on stage, but hopefully in terms of building a community that will take up your call, uh, David, uh, and with the kind of optimism that you've laid out, uh, Corey. So folks are voting now. Somebody tell me whether we're supposed to wait for the vote to be finished or we're going to do the results in the next section. We're going to do the results in the next section. So what we're going to do is take a little break. Please vote before you go on break. And then please do take a little break. And then please, most importantly, come back. We've got a great third group of speakers who are going to be talking about innovative approaches to dealing with some of these questions that we've been laying out uh, so far today. Uh, and uh, of course, after that, we have Bob Work, who's going to be here uh, talking about use of narrative and the third offset uh, strategy. So please stay with us. Thank you very much.